Okay, so today let us uh, start a new topic and that is diffraction theory. So I told you that uh, in historically speaking the uh, subject of optics uh, started uh, with the Newton and Young and all those people they were. So Newton advanced his uh, corpuscular theory of light and Young uh, uh, advanced his uh, wave theory of light and for a long time there was a lot of confusion and uh, later on experiments settled uh, the issue that uh, light is actually uh, described by waves because it exhibits uh, interference and diffraction. But uh, because uh, Newton was such a powerful uh, intellectual in, in those days that he, uh, people were afraid to question his opinion. So even after he died for many decades and centuries, uh, people did not believe wave theory of light simply because Newton uh, was not in favor of it. But of course, uh, very gradually people uh, accepted wave theory of light because that is the only thing that is consistent with uh, experiments uh, in a very obvious way. So what we are going to discuss now is basically the modern uh, version of uh, the theory of interference and diffraction. So basically these two are just uh, convenient terms, but um, the fundamental physics behind both interference and diffraction are basically the same. They come about because electromagnetic waves, the light which is an electromagnetic wave is basically because of its wave nature it exhibits those standard phenomena that we come to know as interference and diffraction. So that basically uh, these two phenomena just tell you that waves typically bend around obstacles, they do not go in, a, in the same direction as if there is some obstacle it kind of bends around it. So intuitively, uh, colloquially speaking that is what it is. So we want to of course have a more uh, quantitative understanding of what that really means which is why you need a theory of diffraction because physics is all about making quantitative statements not just some subjective qualitative statements. So. Uh, you know the subject of optics if you pick up any textbook on optics they will uh, usually describe very uh, phenomenologically motivated approaches uh, such as Fermat's principle and all kinds of other you know seemingly ad hoc uh, approaches are uh, presented first and uh, much later uh, you know a proper description of the electromagnetic uh, theory. So in other words the proper description of interference and diffraction in terms of electromagnetic waves is presented towards the end if at all. So whereas my uh, approach is going to be the reverse, in other words I am going to tell you the correct final answer which is the derivation of uh, the theory of diffraction and interference using electromagnetic theory. Just by uh, the fact that light is an electromagnetic wave I and mean, you simply solve the wave equation with appropriate boundary condition and that is all there is to it. So there is no need to make this any more mysterious than uh, it should be. But of course uh, that approach has a certain drawback in the sense that uh, it will completely ignore the historical ups and downs uh, that led to this final conclusion. If you are the sort of uh, student who only cares about uh, the rigorous final answer without uh, caring much about how it was arrived at historically, what were the important milestones uh, and who were, the, who were the historical figures involved, what mistakes they made, how did they correct them and so on. If, if you are not interested in that sort of approach, then what I am going to discuss will be useful to you. But if you are the sort of uh, student who really wants to delve into the historical motivations for this subject then uh, you should consult some other textbook which would go into that approach. Okay? So my approach is purely rigorous and uh, reductionist so where I simply solve Maxwell's equation and tell you the final answer for diffraction and interference. So, okay, so how do you do that? So obviously uh, you first have to write down those wave equations. So firstly I am going to um, imagine that there is a electromagnetic uh, waves propagating in empty space. So um, but then it is empty apart from, so firstly I am going to assume that 
there are some localized sources and uh, the rest of the space is empty. Let me describe to you the uh, picture I am looking at firstly, let me describe to you, yeah. So this is the picture I am going to be uh, following. So, uh, so there is a source, okay. So there is a source of electromagnetic radiation. So this is, uh, this is going to have some, uh, some currents and uh, densities. So this uh, electrical charges uh, will be uh, moving around and creating electromagnetic waves, okay. So that is this region, but that is a finite localized region. So I am going to assume that. And I am also going to assume that uh, the, uh, uh, the electromagnetic waves are of a fixed frequency. So in other words, there is some kind of a well-defined frequency to the electromagnetic waves. So I will not ask uh, myself uh, or expect you to know precisely what type of sources are going to produce that type of wave, uh, which is purely monochromatic. Uh, but so we will assume somebody has provided us with some source which is monochromatic. So we have to start that way. So we are going to start that way and assume that the sources are localized at this origin. So the origin of our coordinate system is called O which is also the location of the source. Now what happens is that this source produces uh, electromagnetic waves and it goes in all directions and it also uh, ends up here and this here is a screen, so this is a screen, okay, where there is an aperture. That means that this, this is an opaque screen where light cannot pass through this, but there is a, this screen has an aperture. Aperture means just a hole where light can pass through this hole. So there is some hole of some shape and then light passes through and then reaches some point of interest. So what I want to know is that given the fact that light starts from here and it goes through a hole, I want to know what the, uh, uh, if I put a screen, I mean if, if this is the, uh, sorry, this is the, uh, this is not a, uh, basically this is a screen with the aperture, okay, this is a screen with aperture, this is observational screen. Uh, I am sure there are more technical uh, terminology, optics people may use better terminology for this, uh, for screen for observation, okay. So bottom line is that light uh, goes through this aperture and falls on the screen which uh, and then you note down uh, the intensity pattern that you see here, so intensity versus position. So what we want to do is we want to calculate intensity versus position given the fact that light starts from here and it's, uh, it has a fixed frequency and it goes through an aperture, okay. So the question is how do you answer this question? So uh, answering this question basically amounts to understanding the theory of diffraction because that is what happens here. So this aperture, uh, light uh, when it passes through this small aperture, it diffracts. So diffract means that it will actually uh, uh, do this like uh, dif from different points, uh, different lights with different phases will go and uh, they will all interfere and so basically it is uh, it's just interference by uh, uh, from different points on the aperture. So it is, so interference is the simpler phenomenon. So if you have double slit, you have uh, waves coming from here, from coming from here and then they interfere. But here they, they interfere from different points on the aperture and uh, that is called diffraction. So diffraction and interference are just uh, very similar. Basically diffraction is the uh, more, uh, it is a kind of an application of interference to uh, something more realistic. So bottom line is uh, regardless of whether this is as aperture, in fact if you do not like aperture, you replace this by double slit then you will be studying interference. So this analysis is applicable to both uh, the phenomena that uh, whether it is interference or diffraction, it does not matter. So basically uh, it tells you how uh, electromagnetic uh, waves pass through uh, some finite uh, gap in, in the space. So then when the rest of it is closed off and does not, uh, the electromagnetic waves do not have the option of going uh, in the surrounding region but it has to pass through some gap. So that is basically leads to either diffraction or interference depending upon the situation.
So, we want to know how electromagnetic be waves behave when they encounter such obstacles and apertures and so on. So, the answer to that question is uh, obtained by uh, doing the following things. So, that means, you have to follow a systematic procedure. First systematic procedure we have to do is, we have to uh, uh, first describe the electromagnetic waves coming out of that source. So, remember there is a source at that origin O on the extreme left. So, electromagnetic waves are coming out of that source. So, I first want to describe that uh, source. So, then uh, I will just uh, substitute uh, my vector potential and scalar potential forms of the electric and magnetic field. Then this is my Gauss law and this is my Ampere's law and uh, I use my Lorentz gauge. Okay, So, uh, so I, I did not spend enough time explaining gauge, but bottom line is that uh, there is a lot of freedom. I can replace A by A plus grad phi, uh, uh, grad uh, lambda or something, then um, none of this will change. So, I can I have to replace phi by uh, phi minus 1 by C d lambda by d t. So, if I do this, then uh, the my electric and magnetic fields do not change, but my potentials change. So, but the physics uh, is given by electric and magnetic fields. For, uh, potentials are merely convenient, uh, uh, you know, auxiliary functions. So, the point is that there is a lot of freedom in how I choose my uh, vector potential and scalar potential. So, I specifically, uh, because there is so much freedom, I elect to m impose this constraint. So, I can always uh, select a, a phi and a, a which obeys a certain additional constraint. I can always do that because this is consistent with my gauge transformation. So, in fact, you can convince yourself that if, if I replace uh, this by, uh, so basically this, uh, this lambda also has to obey, obey the similar type of, uh, yeah. So, a bottom line is that uh, I can always do this, okay. I, I, I can always do this because there is a freedom in, uh, in how I can choose phi and a. So, having done this, uh, I, I will be able to write down two equations which I have to solve. And these are just uh, pretty much the same things except this one is uh, rho, one is uh, j by c or whatever. So, I will just solve one of them because if I solve one, the other is obtained by just, rip, just copy pasting the symbols. Instead of phi, I put a, instead of rho, I put something else like that. So, uh, but the important thing is whatever it is you want to solve this, we have to first uh, decide how the uh, potentials change with time. So, I told you that I have assumed that the source, so this is basically this phi and a represents what? It is an electromagnetic field coming out of the source which is at point O, that origin on the extreme left, is not it? So, that means that uh, it will uh, come out of the source and uh, uh, so, we have to assume that that source is monochromatic. That means that it has a single frequency. So, what that means is that I am assuming that the currents responsible for the electromagnetic wave will be uh, having a single frequency called omega. So, it is cos omega t, I will select it to be like this cos omega t. And so, because of that I can select A to be also cos omega t because these two are in phase. So, then I just go ahead and uh, so that means uh, basically I just have to solve for t equal to 0 because the time dependence is given by cos omega t. Okay, so, then d squared by dt squared is minus omega squared. So, it is basically cos becomes uh, minus sign, sign becomes cos. Uh, so, and there is an omega every time I differentiate. So, it is minus omega squared instead of d squared by dt squared. So, bottom line is I have to solve this type of equation. And this type of uh, operator, so this is this is has the form. You see what is this? This has the form minus k square plus del square by k equals omega by c. So there is this type of operator there. And this operator del square plus k square is basically called the Helmholtz uh, operator. Okay. So and this equation is called the Helmholtz equation. So this is a Helmholtz equation with a source. So, typically, so, uh, so I told you again and again that if you want to solve uh, uh, equations with source, you have to first solve equation with point source and then add up all those points and get the actual source. So, in other words, your final answer will be the uh, 
linear combination of the answer for all the point sources. So, if g is your answer for a point source, so your delta function is basically the point source. So, it is creating uh, one, uh, so there is at, at r prime there is a source at r equal to r prime and uh, this is your uh, answer for that uh, a vector potential. So, generically it can be either a or phi or whatever you want it to be. So, bottom line is that uh, g is the answer for the variable they are looking for either phi or a for a point source. So, now uh, we have to assume that uh, far away from, uh, so at, at infinity, so that means, uh, you know, far away from the aperture and far away from the source, very far away from both, uh, the fields are all 0, okay, because the sources start at the um, origin which is you know, towards to the left of the aperture and uh, by the time they reach infinity, there will be 0. Uh, amplitude because of basically they will go as 1 by r squared and become 0. So, bottom line is that far away they are all 0. So, if you are, if you assume that then you can solve this equation easily by using what is called uh, uh, this Fourier transform method, this is the easiest way. So, just write uh, g in terms of the Fourier transform and you know that Dirac delta also has this Fourier transform and then you get this. But then you have to also, uh, this ha this has to be interpreted properly, okay. So, the interpretation is such that we retain the principal part, okay. So, that means that uh, this answer is going to be in terms of, so you can convince yourself that this obeys the uh, Helmholtz equation, okay. So, I will allow you to convince yourself that, so this has the important thing that we are looking for. At, at r equal to infinity, it is 0 and uh, at r equal to 0 where the source is present the f the fields i mean basically the fields are infinite which we expect because at the source we expect the fields to be infinite but far away we expect it to be 0 and that's it i mean and then del squared g is basically 0 unless r equals 0 del squared plus k squared g equals 0 unless r is 0 but basically it's going to be that delta function so, bottom line is that this is your answer for the phi or a when you have a point source. So, remember what this capital R is basically small r minus small r dash. So, uh, now that you know what is uh, capital G, so that is the Green's function. So, if you know the Green's function, I have told you uh, that you can write the uh, answer for phi or a in terms of your Green's function. It is going to be this multiplied by the appropriate source, either it is 4 pi rho or it is 4 pi by c into j depending upon whether you want to solve for vector or scalar potential. So, bottom line this is the answer. So, this is the, so these are the fields that means that the vector potential and scalar potential uh, that is being emitted from the point source. So, you see the electric field clearly is minus uh, grad phi minus 1 by c dA by dt and similarly B equals uh, curl of A, okay. So, if you take curl of this, you will you'll know what magnetic field is coming out of the source. If you take uh, minus uh, grad of this man minus dA by dt, you will know that uh, what sort of uh, mag uh, electric field is coming out of the source. So, bottom line is that uh, you know both. So, you, you know what electric and magnetic fields are coming out of the source. But then you see uh, the one drawback about this, uh, of course, this is important, but uh, the not so nice thing about this analysis is that uh, you have to know what is the source that is uh, causing those electromagnetic fields. So, that means you have to know J and you have to know rho. If you do not know these things, you cannot uh, find the electric and magnetic field, okay. So, now what uh, the usual way the question in uh, optics is posed is that Nobody tells you what is the source, this could be the sun for example, which is um, you know millions of miles away and uh, we do not know what sort of source it is producing and we do not care also, that is more importantly we do not care. So, what, what we care about is the fact that it has hit this aperture and we can measure what sort of light uh, from that distant source has hit the aperture. So, I know how to measure what is happening here, that means I know what light is falling on my aperture and given that uh, this kind of light is falling on my aperture, uh, 
I want to be able to calculate what I am going to see on the screen here. See, that is the important thing. So, uh, of course, some, some source has to be involved because otherwise without a source you won't get any light here. But bottom line is that uh, usually you don't know what is the source there. So, you just know that there is a source which has produced some light on my aperture. So, that is what we want to do now. So, what we want to do is that we are going to assume that now we know what this light, what light has fallen. In fact, strictly speaking, you do know from here, from 3.226 and 227, you really can easily find out uh, what is the light that is falling on the aperture. But the only problem is that uh, explicitly knowing requires you to know J and rho. Without knowing J and rho, you cannot know what light has fallen, isn't it? So, but if somebody tells you J and rho, you can actually calculate what light is falling on the aperture. But now let us uh, keep that at the back of my, our mind and proceed. So, now I am going to say that, look, uh, I want to know what is the uh, electric and magnetic field falling on my uh, screen that is where I want to ma make measurements. When uh, I assume what sort of uh, uh, phi and A are uh, sitting on my aperture. So, for that to answer that question as usual I have to use my Green's theorem and Green's theorem so, I told you what, this is the same Green's theorem we used in electrostatics by the way. So, it is the same Green's theorem. So, you see here the, this problem is not about electrostatics and yet we are using the same mathematical technique. So, uh, remember in electrostatics we had this problem of you know a bunch of charges sitting somewhere and a bunch of conductors uh, sitting somewhere else and you want to find the electric potential that means electrostatics electric potential somewhere consistent with those that information and uh, to do that we had to use invoke the Green's theorem. So, here also here there is no uh, conductor or anything and it is not even electrostatics, it is electromagnetic waves and still the mathematical tools are exactly the same. Uh, so, that is the power of this technique called Green's theorem. Okay. You see the region that I am, I told you uh, omega is basically the region uh, which is contained, okay. So, omega represents the region bounded by a surface containing the aperture where the amplitude of light is non-zero, right. And it is basically also excludes this, this region of, uh, so this screen is imaginary, okay. Do not put a screen here in actual practice, it is just imaginary, but there is a point of interest. So, there is a point R, so if this is my origin of my coordinate system, at some location R there is this point of interest, I want to know the electromagnetic field at this point R. So, now I am going to exclude this point R by putting a sphere around it. So, my region this omega is basically uh, to the right of this uh, aperture screen and it excludes the interior of this small sphere, okay. So, that is my omega. So, therefore, uh, the boundary of the uh, of omega is going to be this uh, surface of this small sphere which is I called S epsilon and uh, the surface of this uh, S aperture sheet. The, so, this is the S aperture sheet, okay. So, that is this one. So, now uh, I make use of these uh, identities. So, phi and g obey the same identities. As usual, uh, just like in electrostatics I told you, right that R and R prime uh, are not uh, going to be uh, close because R prime is in sitting in omega, uh, but then R is inside the sphere which uh, inside of the sphere uh, is uh, basically omega excludes the in inside of the sphere, but R is inside the sphere, but R dash is inside omega. So, R, R dash and R do not uh, come close to each other because the minimum distance R and between R and R dash is epsilon. So, it can never be less than that. So, therefore, uh, del square plus k square of uh, uh, g is actually instead of being Dirac delta, it is actually 0 because Dirac delta will never be a possibility because R and R prime can never approach each other. So, their, their minimum distance is epsilon. So, bottom line is that uh, if you uh, accept that then you can clearly see that uh, 
del squared plus k squared is, is basically 0. So, this is nothing but uh, minus k squared phi and uh, del squared g is 0. So, this is basically 0. So, you can split up the right hand side into, so the left hand side is trivial because uh, del squared is known and, uh, and del squared g is 0. Okay, del squared g is 0 and uh, uh, del squared phi is minus k squared phi. So, that part is simple. So, the right hand side uh, is, uh, is clearly del squared plus k squared g is 0. So, basically del squared g is minus k squared g. So, this is actually a minus k squared g. So, both of them will cancel out, okay. So, because this is, uh, yeah, so this is plus k squared g into phi r, this is minus k squared g into phi r and uh, there is a, sorry, this is minus k squared c, del squared g is minus k squared g, del squared phi is also minus k squared phi. So, if I subtract out, uh, I will basically get 0 because they are, they are basically the same, okay. So, this part is fully 0. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So now uh, this is so that means this right hand side is zero. But then what is right hand side? It is the sum over uh, the surfaces. But then there are two surfaces. One is this surface S aperture, and then the other surface is this uh, this surface, the S epsilon. So there are two uh, separate surfaces. One is the surface containing the aperture. One containing the small epsilon surface around R. So, that is what I have done here. So, this S epsilon and then S aperture. So, now if I use my usual trick and you see that because it is a small sphere, I can do my uh, d by dr is uh, basically I told you in electrostatics 4 pi epsilon squared that argument. You do that again exactly, there is no difference, that is exactly the same argument. You just copy paste that argument here, you get this answer. So, this S epsilon answer will be minus phi r. So basically, this is going to say that this, this is what it is. So that means the uh, vector potential, uh, basically the scalar potential uh, at some point r and therefore also if you want vector potential instead of phi you put a. So uh, bottom line is whatever it is, whether it is vector or scalar potential, the answer at point r is given by the answer for the phi on the aperture. So if you know what it is on the aperture. If you know phi and its normal derivative, if you know what it is on the aperture, you can tell what it is if some, some other distance from the aperture. So now the question is how do you, of course this is, uh, this is pretty much the same as what we got in electrostatics, there is no difference. But then we cannot proceed further until uh, somebody tells us what is the phi hitting the aperture. Right, so we have to, nobody is going to tell us that, nobody is going to tell us anything, we just have to calculate everything ourselves. So that is the reason why we spent so much effort uh, studying the first part of the problem. That is, we started from the source, so we assumed as a, some kind of a source of monochromatic electromagnetic waves which is producing uh, these waves. And then these waves from that source which is sitting at some uh, uh, point which we have called the origin and they will come and finally hit the aperture and that is what this phi is. This is the phi hitting the aperture, so on the right hand side. So on the left hand side is what phi is after it comes out when it reaches point R, okay. So the question is uh, what is the phi hitting the aperture? So the answer is you can uh, basically assume, so now we have to make some approximations. So now we assume that uh, the, the source which is the origin of the coordinate system is very far from the uh, aperture. So for example, it could be the sun and earth, you know your aperture is on earth and the source is the sun or, or it can be even closer but bottom line is that uh, you have to assume that. Uh, your aperture dimensions are small compared to the distance between the, so your aperture, uh, the maximum size of your aperture is very small compared to the distance between the source of your radiation and the distance between that and the aperture, okay. So you have to assume that your aperture is very small compared to the distance between source and aperture. So if you assume that you make this, uh, this becomes your standard uh, 
you know uh, r minus r dash is what magnitude is r squared plus r dash squared minus 2 r r dash cos theta raised to 1 half where theta is the angle between r and r dash because r is very large this can be ignored and then you pull this out and so on and so forth you get this okay yeah so you, you get uh, you do taylor series in this half uh, you get 1 by 2 Anyway, this is standard uh, thing you see in uh, you know in your course in electromagnetic theory, which is supposed to be prerequisite for this course. Remember what this course is: dynamics of classical and quantum fields. So it's somewhat advanced. You are supposed to know all these things. Okay. Uh, bottom line is that uh, as far as uh, the um, this is important to do because R is very large. R dash is very small compared to R. See what is R dash. So uh, R dash is the, uh, this is your R minus R dash and this is your uh, R dash, okay. So we have to assume that uh, the source is far away from the screen, okay. So, so you can make this assumption. But then when, when you do that, you see this R, so, so you do not have to worry about this R dash that much. You can approximate this by R, so because R is much larger than R dash, but then this this becomes this okay so so inside the cos because it's an oscillatory function you cannot ignore r dash because it's oscillatory so let me uh, let me not spend too much time explaining all these steps so rather than uh, explaining verbally all these equations so let us see the final answer see if it makes sense see what is this saying so if there is some source sitting at some origin and it is emitting electromagnetic waves somewhere far away from that uh, source what is it going to be it's going to be basically spherical waves sin kr by kr into cos omega t basically it's saying it's a spherical wave okay so that is the bottom line so it's a spherical wave so these are spherical waves so those spherical waves from the uh, source will come and hit the aperture okay so and those spherical waves will uh, then uh, hit the aperture and they become so that is uh, so this r is basically in general but if uh, if if it hits the aperture it's going to be r dash because r dash is the location where it hits r is in general okay r dash is where it hits and uh, r dash is a point on the aperture so then some spherical wave so what this means is basically some spherical wave starting from some remote origin has hit the aperture uh, and the aperture uh, a point on the aperture is labeled by uh, r dash vector and it's a uh, monochromatic so cos omega t so now the thing is now you go ahead and see so now you know what uh, phi is ex ex explicitly okay so now you can go ahead and find all these things see the reason why we were not able to use this important result 3.231 which basically tells you the what is the field that is going to be seen at some point r uh, on the right side of the aperture that is what we are interested in we were not able to actually fully answer that because we have to know what is hitting the aperture which is the phi and uh, its normal component so now we have figured that out because we know ex explicitly what is hitting the aperture so this is hitting the aperture 3.234 so now we know that it's hitting the aperture you figure out g is anyway the greens function which i have told you it's minus cos kr by kr okay so uh, so that we figured that out the helmholtz equation greens function so this is what we have to figure out so this is the thing which is this, this is the new ingredient phi and its normal derivative okay so now we go ahead and simply substitute this answer and this answer into this equation okay which is into 3. Point 2, 3, 1. So, when you substitute that you get what is called, so this is the famous uh, answer. Yeah, so, this is the most general theory of diffraction you can think of and this is called the kirchhoff fresnel integral, okay. So, this 3.236 is the famous kirchhoff fresnel integral. So, now uh, see it involves uh, it involves some important things called cos alpha and cos beta. So, what is cos alpha and cos beta? So, if you work this out, you will see that what alpha and beta are basically this, okay. It is it's, uh, it's pi, so beta is this angle, 
and alpha is this angle ok. So, this angle is alpha. So, it involves these two angles. So, cos alpha is the cosine of the angle made by a ray from a point on the aperture to a point of interest on the screen and cos beta is the cosine of the angle made by a ray from the source to a point on the aperture. So, beta is, uh, is the angle made by the ray from the source to the aperture and alpha is uh, cos alpha is the angle uh, I mean basically alpha is angle made by ray from point on the aperture to the point on the screen ok. So, you have a source aperture screen. So, the aperture is in the middle. So, uh, you have a cos beta from the source to the aperture and you have a cos alpha from the aperture to the screen ok. So, this is the famous Kirchhoff Fresnel integral. Now, um, a limiting case of this uh, is called Fresnel diffraction, where the distance from the source uh, to the aperture and the screen to the aperture are large compared to the dimension. So, not only source to aperture, but even the screen to aperture are large compared to the dimension of the aperture. So, if the source is anyway far away, but the screen need not be far away compared to the aperture. So, the, you can keep the screen very close to the aperture if you want. If you keep the screen very close to the aperture, you do not have any choice, you have to uh, do this difficult integration in 3.236, so which is the Kirchhoff Fresnel integral. But if you keep the screen far away from the aperture, a lot of simplifications are possible and those simplifications lead to what is called Fresnel diffraction. So, that Fresnel diffraction is when you shift the move the screen far away from the aperture. So, if you assume that the aperture is in the xy plane, you can uh, just uh, pull out this z, okay, which is the uh, distance from the some central point in the aperture to, to your point of interest. And in which case, uh, because uh, both the distances uh, are far away, right. So, if because they are far away, cos alpha is approximately minus 1, cos beta is plus 1. So, if all these angles are very small, okay. so if the source uh, source aperture is very large and uh, aperture screen is also very large compared to the dimensions of the aperture, so they are pretty much collinear, both the lines are collinear and all your angles are 0, 0 or pi whatever, it depends on how you look at it. So, bottom line is that uh, these, ang these angles become very simple and then you get this answer. And this answer is basically, uh, um, so if you, uh, you can pull this out, okay. So, you can see that you can pull this out and uh, you can rewrite this as the Fourier transform of the aperture. So, we assume that x is very large compared to x dash. So, in which case you just Taylor series then keep only the linear terms. So, when you keep the linear terms, see x minus x dash whole squared will be approximately x squared minus 2 x x dash because x dash squared is approximately small I mean small compared to the, the other terms. So, then you get this ok. So, what this is uh, it signifies a kind of a Fourier transform in two dimensions because you can always think of this some new vector you can introduce. So, which is some q vector which is uh, k by z minus z dash into x comma y. So, this is your two dimensional vector and uh, so this you can write this as e raised to minus q uh, dot x where your uh, x dash right. So, your x dash is uh, x dash comma y dash. So, uh, so basically this is so it is like the Fourier transform your four, so there is an aperture function here which is one only. So, in other words you can integrate over all space except you put an aperture function which says that this thing is 0 unless 0 if you are outside the aperture is 1 inside the aperture. So, then it is Fourier transform of the aperture function. So, it is basically if you define aperture function as, as a quantity which is 0 when x dash y dash is inside the aperture it is it is 1 outside it is 0 then basically what you are doing is this is just like a Fourier transform of that aperture function. So, this is the well known Fraunhofer diffraction theory. So, you can see that what we have done is we have rigorously we have started from Maxwell's equations 
uh, with sources and uh, we have made the next assumption that the sources are monochromatic. Then we have uh, assumed the sources are localized at some point in the origin and then we have figured out the Green's functions and we have figured out uh, fields emanating from the source and then we have used that and we have assumed that the aperture is also finite uh, in extent and then uh, we have just gone ahead and we used Green's theorem to figure out uh, what comes outside the aperture. So, electromagnetic theory rigorously answers this question. It tells you what comes outside the aperture. So, this is what comes outside the aperture 3.236 and that is basically the Kirchhoff Fresnel integral for diffraction. So, this is this answers all those questions diffraction interference anything in between whatever you want and uh, a simplified version of a Kirchhoff Fresnel integral is possible when the distance between the aperture and the screen uh, is a very large compared to the dimensions of the aperture in which case uh, this becomes just the Fourier transform of the aperture function. So, your fields are just Fourier transforms of the aperture function. So, you can uh, work out examples where I have uh, uh, imagined a square aperture. So, if it is a square aperture, you will see that uh, the diffraction pattern looks like this. So, it is kind of there is a central spot which is bright. So, if light was not electromagnetic wave, it was just a bunch of streaming particles, you would only see this central bright square because whatever comes out of the square aperture will simply go and hit the screen in the same way. So, it will just be a basically it is as if like you are shifting that aperture from the or its original location and pasting it on the screen. So, that is what it would have been if light was simply a stream of particles. But uh, you see these there are these sides uh, things here the, the bright spots on the sides and that is of course an indication that light is not behaving like a stream of particles you know all of a sudden it is not only deciding to go outside the square, it is actually deciding to go outside by a certain fixed distance and it is trying to uh, preferentially sit some fixed distance from the square and it is even avoiding this dark side in between uh, portion in between. So, that is completely bizarre. If you think of a light as a stream of particles, you will never be able to explain this. So, why would light, a, light, a stream of particles do this? It suddenly hop from the edge of the square and completely avoids the immediate portion to the right of the square and then just decide to sit on uh, some portion to the right of that. So, that would be completely unexplainable if you think of light as a made of streaming particles, but uh, it is completely explainable because light is a wave and then waves kind of bend around obstacles and they uh, add up and cancel out and so on. So, the dark portions indicate that um, the waves have destructively interfered and they have cancelled out here, they have added up and constructively and so on. So, like that you can work out the shadow of an, uh, so if you if you have a so, the you, you what I described is a basically an aperture that means the rest of it is blocking the light and there is only a small portion which is allowing light. You can do the reverse. You can have a circular disc which is blocking the light and outside that circular disc light is allowed. So, you can ask the same question and answer you will see that the center of the so no, normally so in other words that the the disc will leave a shadow on the screen. So, that means if you shine light on that on that opaque disc, uh, there is going to be a shadow of the disc on the screen, but uh, normally you do not you expect the shadow to be completely dark. In other words, uh, you expect only light to be outside that circle uh, on the boundary of the circle. But then if you look at uh, the center of that if you look at the center of that screen, uh, disc, the center of the shadow carefully, you will actually see a bright spot and that is called the Arago spot and that would be impossible again if light uh, 
was a stream of particles. There is no way light would have reached the center of a shadow if it were a stream. By definition, uh, the center of the shadow is the portion which is completely blocked by the disk because it's the shadow is because light is being blocked. So the center of the shadow should be even more inaccessible. But then you will see that uh, if you examine it closely, the center of the shadow is actually bright. So that is called the Arago spot and that is simply because of uh, the light which uh, comes around uh, the edges of the disk uh, kind of bends around and constructively interferes at the center and creates a bright spot. So that is called the Arago spot. So uh, these are the two applications, important applications of diffraction theory. The simple Fresnel diffraction for a square aperture may be in the Arago spot of a shadow caused by an opaque disk. So I am going to stop here and in the next class I will discuss uh, some other topic. So perhaps I will move to the next chapter which is basically elasticity theory and fluid dynamics. So okay, I am going to stop here, uh, hope to see you in the next class. Thank you.